So last June, after the murder of George Floyd by four Minneapolis police officers, a number of parishioners gathered on Zoom in a series of weekly sessions to discuss what happened, uh, keeps happening, and how the people of Christ the King must respond. The major outcome of these reflection sessions was the creation of Christ the King's anti-racism ministry, uh, still in its early days, uh, which is really a framework for parishioners to create and participate in various grassroots efforts that focus on promoting racial justice issues uh, within our parish and in collaborating with ventures in the wider Nashville community. Uh, later on um, this spring, after the series, we'll have a town hall meeting. Uh, for anyone who's interested to hear more about these projects, um, and might like to get involved in one of the ongoing projects or perhaps start a new one. Start my Zoom. One of these projects is designed to create opportunities for our community to better understand the history of white supremacy in our own area and how various institutions continue to sustain it uh, despite the work of our better angels. These folks have worked hard to put together this series. Uh, so I would like to thank tonight, Spencer Mullen, Susan Ratcliffe, and especially Jim O'Hara for their efforts in this. And before I reintroduce tonight's speaker, let me put in a plug for this coming Sunday session. Uh, we'll have Deacon Bill Hill, formerly of St. Vincent de Paul Parish, uh, currently serving Holy Family in Brentwood. Uh, he'll be offering us a history of the original Holy Family Parish, not in Brentwood, and St. Vincent de Paul Parish. He'll highlight the roles of Catherine Drexel, uh, Bishop Byrne, and Father Thomas Plunkett. So if you join us on Zoom at 1030, um, you can participate in that. You will need to register for a new link on our website. This one won't work for that. So tonight we welcome back Dr. Lurother Williams. He's professor of African-American and public history at Tennessee State University. We'll benefit tonight from his research on the history of African-American slaves in Nashville uh, prior to the American Civil War um, and uh, what happens in reconstruction after they're freed. The title of today's presentation is Out from a Gloomy Past, Black Nashville's Struggle for Equality in History and Memory, 1863 to the Present. As last Sunday's session demonstrated, Dr. Williams is very hospitable to questions and conversation about these realities, past and present. So please feel free to pose your questions in the chat during his talk or wait until the end uh, to vocalize them for the Q&A. So Dr. Williams, thanks again for dedicating your time to us tonight and a warm welcome to you. Now, um, thank you all for having me back. It's um, rare during Black History Month that I, I speak to the same audience twice in a month. So this is a historic moment for me as well. So you can, I, I like that. Um, you can say that, hey, for good or bad, he spoke to us twice in one month. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, today, I want to okay. Today, I, I want to take a brief look at our struggle, Black Nashville struggle for equality in history and, and memory. And we'll go from roughly 1863 to the present. And as we did last time, I want you to consider these events and consider how we represent them, if we represent them in our public spaces. Um, this will be a story of a struggle for equality, a struggle for equal rights, but it's not going to be the story that I, I think most of you are used to when you think of civil rights. Um, this evening, what I want you to, what I'm going to try to do is to get you to focus on the different ways that struggle manifests itself. And I'm doing that for a reason because um, one of the things that we hear over and over again is about how this, the Black Lives Matter movement is different 
from what you see in the 1960s. And I humbly submit to you, it's supposed to be different because it's different people um, confronting white supremacy to be sure, but a lot has happened between the 50 years that Diane Nash confronted Mayor Ben West at the at the at, at City Hall and what we see today. Um, one might argue that expectations are a bit higher at this time and by that same token, frustration. So um, the target might be the same, the thing that you're fighting against might be the same, but the people who are fighting might be a bit more frustrated right now because all the stuff that they expected to have been accomplished during this period um, still has to be dealt with. Um, so this evening, I, I pulled up a little bit early last hour. So I want to finish um, talking about reconstruction and then we'll segue into um, this, this, this conversation I want to have tonight. Okay. Um, I, I take a lot of pictures, a lot of photographs, but this is, this remains one of my favorite. Um, what you see are, um, these are Nashville's, I mean, Tennessee State University civil rights, I, I call them our warriors. Um, Two of them recently passed last last year. Um, Mr. Alan Kaysen right here in the middle. Um, he died almost a year ago, and then Kwame Lillard um, recently passed. When I I took this picture, I, I was like, "Gosh, I have them all in one place." And usually I run into them one at a time somewhere here or there and I'm able to ask them questions. But at, at this moment, um, I was able to bug all of them at the same time. So that was rare and special in and of itself. But I, after I took this, this photo, I thought about how these, these memories that we have of these events we're still at a point in our history where they can actually be informed um, by the, the people that participated in them. And as I sat there and, 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 and snapped this pit picture, um, I was mindful of the place where, where I was. If you remember from last hour, we talked about how they sold slaves at the public square every Saturday around two o'clock. Um, so it's a stage for enslavement, but by the same token, when they were out and about during the 60s, they transformed that space into a, a place of liberation, a place where they fought for equality. So I think that this, this photograph um, itself is representative of the struggle that struggle for equality that we're going to take a few minutes to explore this evening. This um, is a sketch from Harper's Weekly. It doesn't really have a title, but it, it's um, in class. I say this is when the Yankees showed up the town in town um, in, in, in February of 1862. But it rightly could be called freedom because this is a moment when um, if you're an enslaved or a free person living in, in Nashville, once you saw these soldiers in town, you understood that nothing, nothing would ever be the same. So this, this, this generational curse, if you will, that black women carried within, the, within their wombs um, knowing that whatever child they gave birth to, if they were enslaved, that baby was going to be brought into a, 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 a life of enslavement. This was the day that it was broken. But freedom was 
ambiguous. The how they define it was ambiguous. The notions of equality was 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 different depending upon if you were black or white. Because African Americans, once this occurs, they figure that, hey, they are going to enjoy the same sort of freedoms, the same sort of rights as 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 um as everybody else in America. And from the reception that they got from their their, their former masters or from whites in general, right? Um this seemed to suggest that they feared the same thing. But that didn't turn out to be the case. First, um, shortly after they arrived, they began to conscript African Americans into, um, for lack of a better purpose, into labor camps to work to build the fortifications around the city of Nashville. Um, they brought out there at the end of the of a bayonet. So whereas before their former masters compelled them to work by use of the whip, the gun, and the club, um, Union soldiers, those guys that they thought were supposed to be their allies, um, compelled many of them to work on fortifications. We know for certain, well, we have a record of um, 2,771 people that were conscripted into laboring on um, Nashville's defenses. Some of them got paid, some of them did not get paid. So freedom, the freedom that they were expected didn't turn out how they thought. But then as we move on, we find that the conditions that they were forced to labor under, the conditions that they were forced to live under, um, were, were, um, were, were in some cases atrocious. But another thing happens during the course of them working there, right? Um, some formerly enslaved African-Americans, freedom-seeking African-Americans began to flock to these places and they, they, the army places them in what was known as contraband camps. These camps were their first taste of freedom, but it was a heck of a first taste. Many of them, for many of them, their, their first taste of freedom was to lose track of, of um, their family members. For many of them, their first taste of freedom was to live in fear of being re-enslaved. Because while they are under union protection here, and this is true in Nashville and it's probably true in other places as well. Um, but there were a group of men in East Nashville who um, remained loyal to the Confederacy. Furthermore, they patrol these camps where these people were being held. And at night, they would try to catch someone off from the crowd and, and, and um, put them in a position where they could be kidnapped. Then they would be taken along, um, goodness, I can't remember, along Hillsborough Pike to Franklin, where there was a banker who was working sort of as a fence. And then the banker would have his people take these people, take the um, people that were captured out of the contraband camp. They would take them to Alabama. And for many, many African Americans, their worst, their worst fear was being sold into the deep south. So I, I'm saying all that to say this: um, freedom manifests itself in the shadows of its fort but they found that freedom could also be elusive. And this is a report from a missionary association that was here in town that um, was writing back to his superiors in Pennsylvania to get supplies for, for um, the folks that found themselves at the base of Fort Negley. And it reads as follows. It says, again, those tents 
such as they were, were wholly insufficient in number and in consequence were crowded beyond their capacity in order that they might seem to shelter the inmates of the camp, very many of whom were sick and died from neglect on the part of those whose duty it was to provide care for them. So as I read that, I thought like, wow, many of them, for many of the folks that came there, their first taste of freedom was to get sick or watch a loved one get sick and die. Um, another account that I remember reading stated that maybe about 30 wagons, I mean, a wagon loaded down with perhaps 30 bodies per day was observed coming from out of the forts around Nashville. And you start thinking about how long they were there, three years, and on average 30 a day. And even if that number is off, um, looking at thousands of people whose remains are unaccounted for. Um, perhaps they are still at Fort Negley. I, I suspect that they might even be where the Greer parcel used to be, but we'll know for certain because um, um, there's work being done to figure out what's down there. But a question, and I pose this to my class today, and I'm posing it to you in terms of memory. Let's say they do find 50, 100, or 1,000 um, um, bodies there, formerly enslaved people who came here seeking equality. Um, the question I pose that I'm giving to you is how will we remember that? What will we do with that space? Um, if y'all have any bright ideas or any interesting ideas, um, email them to me and I'll pass them along to the people that need to hear it. One of the most visible manifestations of the struggle for equality was um, the, the arrival of Black soldiers, the United States Colored Troops. Um, these regiments began to form shortly after the um, Emancipation Proclamation was signed on January 1st. 1863. Once that's once it's signed, Lincoln is able to issue an order to um, the soldiers that are out in the field that they can um, they can arm enslaved, formerly enslaved African Americans. And this was something that had been fought for by blacks throughout the North. One of the most notable was Frederick Douglass. Um, he wrote that Lincoln was actually trying to fight the war almost with one hand behind his back, if you can imagine, him not using these African-American soldiers. Over the course of the war, roughly 180,000 African-Americans bore arms for the Union. And this is, I think, one of the most remarkable stories of the Civil War because um, for them, this war was definitely a struggle for freedom. The war was all about ending slavery for them. And, and for many of them who, um, who gave their lives, they gave it willingly so that their families, so that their friends and their posterity could be free. Um, this photograph is from the um, from the um, Nashville National Cemetery out off Galton Road. It's, um, it's a good place to go out and reflect on what they are fighting for, your notions of freedom and equality. And it's always nice, that's one of the nicest places to go uh, if it snows in Nashville. So if you're a person that likes to get out, take a moment to go out there. Um, this statue, um, the model for the statue was a, a, a gentleman named Bill Radcliffe, and he's still around today. And it turns out that his ancestor was one of the formerly enslaved people at Fort Negro. 
it's a beautiful statue and it's very profoundly connected um, to the city. Now, I want to draw your attention to this. Um, this is a photograph of an enslaved, formerly enslaved family. As you notice the gentleman in the, um, in the Union Army out, um, uniform. And he's sitting up with his family. And, and one of the things, one of the things that they immediately try to do to, um, to, I guess what I'm trying to say, to repair some of the damage that slavery had done was it, it was a move to reconnect with their families. And these these photographs, as we look into their eyes, you see, uh, well, I see a lot of uncertainty. They're not knowing what um, what the future holds. But for me, this reveals that this there's a strong sense of family there. Even for the extended families that were necessary during slavery, to have these sort of support systems that were needed to survive, you, you see that. One of the things that immediately occur after emancipation is that you begin to see um, help wanted, well, not help wanted ads, excuse me, um, ads, classified ads in the newspapers where they are seeking their families. And for me, and if you can imagine, and most of you are old enough to remember when um, you'd open up the newspaper and go to the classified ads and you could find a job there or, or um, things that were for sale. It was really stark for me being able to go to this, this Nashville newspaper and opening it up and seeing an information wanted ad. And this one in particular is interesting because it, it um, I'll read it to you. It says, information wanted. Information is wanted of my two boys, James and Horace, one of whom was sold in Nashville and the other was sold in Rutherford County. I myself was sold in Nashville and sent to Alabama by William Boyd. I and my children belong to David Moss, who was connected to the penitentiary, penitentiary in some capacity, Charity Moss. P.S. Any information sent to Colette Tennessee office box 1150 will be thankfully received. When I look at that, I see hope in that his people can be recovered, but also see there's a sense of desperation going through that because as you read through this, you see that his family was scattered to the four winds. And I, I draw your attention to that because when when we see um, protests today, like when we saw the George Floyd murder, when we saw Trayvon Martin, we, we heard his screams. And, and, and for many African-Americans, those, those screams resonated because we understood that it could have been somebody that we were related to. Because we, the, the thing that I'm suggesting to you or the thing that I want you to consider in all of this is that up until 1870, it's kind of tough tracing our genealogy. That is because African-Americans were treated as property, right? So um, I'm saying that the idea that I was born and raised in Florida, but I got a lot of people in Georgia, relatives in South Carolina. My relatives are all over the place, but I'm just now finding about them as an adult. So for us, every one of these, these, these episodes we have of injustice and in death, we feel that very profoundly. So I remember when um, President Obama remarked that Trayvon Martin could have been his son, that, that, that statement really resonated um, with me because it, it, it um, I was like, I, he very well could have been 
my piano. As we move to the end of the war, um, the, the virtual year of Jubilee, um, there are certain things that emerge as, as, as symbols, as monuments to Black freedom. Um, one being the desire for an education. I humbly submit to you that um, the schoolhouse becomes almost as important as the church. That, that is in many places, in many, many places, the first thing you see that'll go up um, during this period, during, during um, um, reconstruction would be a church. And then as soon as they get a little bit more money, the next thing they would do is put up a school. So the church and the school, the relationship was intimate. And this plays itself out even in the colleges. Um, Fisk University was established in 1866. It was established as a school to, to educate the freed person. The very first permanent building that emerges um, on Fisk campus in North Cal in, in North Nashville was Jubilee Hall. Now, many of you know the story of um, the Fisk Jubilee singer, so I won't go into a whole lot of detail on it. But I, I will. This is what I want you to understand is that when they began their international tour, you know, they are singing, um, singing the sorrow songs. They are singing the songs that their parents and their grandparents raised up out of the cotton fields. And it's peculiar in this regard because many of them are from Tennessee, right? So the same songs that resonated out of the cotton fields or the tobacco fields. Many of the songs that they sang when they stole away to remote locations where they could sing and pray and pour out their, their emotions, their spirit in a way, in a place that their master couldn't hear them. These are the, 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 the songs, their raising of these songs for the world to hear is what enabled them to raise what I argue is the most magnificent um, piece of 19th century architecture in, in Nashville. We have a lot of 19th century architecture that I, that I dig out there. I'm a historic preservationist, right? So I, I'm, I'm kind of down with the, the uh, with Victorian architecture, but none of them have, has the soul of Jubilee Hall. And even the name Jubilee um, is taken from the, I hate quoting scripture in public because uh, my father might see it. And if I say the wrong scripture, I'm going to hear about it. Um, but um, 25th chapter of Leviticus talks about the year uh, Jubilee. In every 50 years, um, God instructed the Hebrews to forgive debts and set the bondsmen free. And that makes sense that when they built this building, they would call it Jubilee Hall, right? Because it's a very visible symbol that, you know, enslavement or permanent in, uh, or enslavement was never supposed to be a permanent feature of somebody's existence. So Jubilee Hall today stands as a symbol of freedom in the music city. And of course, Fisk plays prominently in this. And, 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 and maybe I can come back and talk about North Nashville next year. But Fisk, the people that go to Fisk, 
help to redefine what it means to be free, some of the intellectual giants that come through there. Help redefine what it means to be free. And it goes from W.E.B. Du Bois to Diane Nash in the 1960s. And still to this day, I have some friends that are FISC graduates that are still pushing us to rethink of what it means to be both um, free and, and Black in America. Having said all of that, and, and, and it appears as though Reconstruction is a, a period of um, high expectations but that did not apply to everybody. I mean, it's, it's, it's a story of, of hope, but it's also a story that reveals the worst of humanity. Because whereas I said earlier that the church, I mean, the school education becomes as important as, um, as the church in many instances, um, a lot of folks in the South pushed back against educating African-Americans. A lot of folks pushed back violently against that, so much so that shortly after the war ended, you have the, um, the organization of a white supremacist white supremacist terrorist organization in Pulaski, Tennessee. Um, and this group, we know it today as the Ku Klux Klan. But it went by a lot of different names. Um, in, in, in some places it was called the Klan, other places they called themselves Night Riders. Um, the, the names varied, but the goal was the same, the goal being to keep African Americans in a position as close to slavery as possible. Now, initially, the Klan formed sort of as a political slash Greek organization because the term uh, Ku Klux is actually taken from the Greek word meaning um, Greek word kuklos, meaning circle or band. Then, when we start thinking about some of the titles that they held, um, like you had the Cyclops, and the Cyclops, you know, is a figure from Greek mythology, the one with the one eye. Um, you have the Furies and so forth. And then finally, um, at the local level, you have um, a group that was known as the, um, they, they would belong to, um, uh, a space that was known as the clavern. And what is interesting about this is, and curious as well, is that everything that enslaved, formerly enslaved African Americans wanted, everything the freedmen wanted would have benefited poor whites, which there were an abundance of in the South. Poor uneducated whites would have benefited from every single thing they called for. But nevertheless, they rallied around this notion of white supremacy so that in, in their minds, no matter how bad off they were, they were still better than the most well-to-do white person. I mean, black person, excuse me. So in essence, what we have is a sort of psychological wage that poor whites received by joining the Klan or sympathizing with the Klan. And the Klan used violence to accomplish their goals. And I know even this, this, this evening, I um, spent a little time preparing a statement about why the bust of Nathan Bedford Forrest shouldn't be um, in, in a public space like the Capitol. Um, and and I, 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 without getting too far gone on this, I, I understand sometimes the need for heroes or whatever, but I, um, um, 
Nathan, of all of the 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 people that I think don't deserve celebration or honor in in um, American history, Nathan Bedford Forrest is one of them. And the record is clear on that. I um as a PhD student, my my uh, major professor said, well, Lee, um, we're going to study clan violence this summer. This is all you're going to do. And um, it's like, all right, because I'm interested in reconstruction. And uh, he instructed me to go to the basement, sub the sub basement of the library on campus and read through the KKK records. It's like, all right, that'll be a pretty interesting. But there are 15 volumes of them. And each of the volumes was maybe about three, about oh, two, I three inches thick. I, make, so I haven't started the video. Um, so I went through and I read and I read and I read and every day that I went to the library to read that, I, I left and was just devastated by the material that I was reading. Um, and I'm sharing with you, I'm going to share an expert, excerpt with you today that is relevant um, to Nashville. Um, and I, I'll, I'll read this um, and, and, and discuss it for a moment, then we'll press on. Um, this is an excerpt from a guy named John Lawson. John Lawson worked for um, worked for an individual who paid him some of the money that he was owed for his labor and then kicked him off the land. But here, here's his testimony. He says he paid me $7, half of what he owed me, and then left. I stayed till night. He came home that night and two Ku Klux came about the same time. They came to the cabin where I was and came in the cabin after breaking open the door. They were in the cabin when I slipped out. It being dark, one of them said to the other, come, let us kill this damn Negro. They followed me up and fired four shots at me. I got away and hid. The next morning I started for Nashville and with them about one quarter of a mile from where I started, I found a man hanging up by the feet. He had been skinned. His skin was hanging over his neck and his privates had been cut off and put in his mouth. I did not know who he was. I have heard of no such thing before. It looked as if it had been done that night. I was close to him so I could see distinctly. I came direct to Nashville and am here for safety. And that's John Lawson. So when we hear this and we're mindful that we have uh, um, um, several volumes of this type of material here, and this then uh, take into account that Congress, when they began to interview people about the Klan, um, this doesn't even take into account the stories that they did not catch. But I humbly submit to you this evening that a lot of those stories pass down from word of mouth over the generations. My father used to tell my father used to tell ghost stories about Camilla Georgie. This is one patch of highway that they used to say was haunted. And then, then we thought. He's just telling stories to entertain us children. Um, but when I got into college, I learned about something called the Camilla riot, where African Americans were indiscriminately shot in the back by law enforcement as they were going to vote. So well, when you start thinking about that legacy of violence for whom nobody has um, ever been held account, to what we are witnessing today, um, the, the I, I, I only submit to you that it, it's it's a wonder that we hadn't seen something like this manifest itself earlier in our history.
as reconstruction ends, the next big issue is the, the, the proper way for Blacks to struggle for freedom in the United States, whether there was one way that was preferable to another way. And this is what we're dealing with today as well. This comes closely on the heels of um, the Supreme Court case, Plessy versus Ferguson, where Homer Plessy sues, um, he actually sues the train company in Louisiana because he bought a first class ticket and he was removed from the train because he had African ancestry. So the case goes to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court in a 7-1 um, decision um, concludes that it's okay to separate according to race as long as equal facilities are provided for both races. So this is the start of Jim Crow segregation in the South. And I say in the South because Jim Crow was perfected in the North and then it migrated in the South after, um, after the, the infamous Supreme Court case. So what's the best route for freedom? There are two camps that emerged during this period, um, one being led by Booker T. Washington and Booker T. Washington um, places an emphasis on vocational education, vocational training that is becoming skilled at a particular um, trade. And then believing that once you were able to um, prove yourself invaluable um, to Southern society, then equality would come. So he wasn't one that was for pushing for social equality right at the moment, right now. This is something that he saw in the future. And there's uh, another camp that emerged, that, that's created by a, by a Fiskite. Um, this gentleman was W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois was without doubt one of the greatest intellectuals that this country has produced. Um, du Bois was, I want to claim him as a historian because he got his PhD from Harvard, um, but he was also a Pan-Africanist, one of the early founders of American sociology. Um, brilliant, brilliant man. But within the context of this talk, I want you to focus on him as one of the earliest, most strongest proponents for civil rights um, in America at the turn of the century. Du Bois was um, one of the earliest black people to hold a position of power in the NAACP, National Association for the uh, advancement of colored people. Matter of fact, he was one of the only two black people in a position of power when it first opened. It was him and the other being um, Ida B. Wells. But um, I, I want you to focus on him and, and this statement that um, he wrote in his book, The Souls of Black Folk, just let that marinate a little bit as we make our way through this talk. Du Bois writes in the souls of black folk, he says, one ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. What he's referencing here is a, a a, um, a term that has become popularly known as the double consciousness, where this is something where African Americans are asking whether it's even possible for them to be Black and American at the same time. 
is it possible for them to embrace their 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 culture, their uh, their Africanness, and still be American, but it's also having to question whether or not if if I'm going to be an American, whether everything that is black within me, everything that gives me my identity, has to die. Um, although he wrote he wrote this book at the turn at the dawn of the 20th century, this is something that um, many African Americans still find themselves grappling with grappling with today. Now I want to focus on um, another part of the struggle for equality, one that you all may not have considered in the past, but one that I want to draw your attention to, particularly when we talk about public memory. You know, I can cite some names to you all right now that you probably will recognize, um, such as Preston Taylor, the um, it's kind of tough just calling him a, biz, uh, a, a, a minister, but he was a minister and a businessman, prominent um, Nashvillian. Um, J.C. Napier is a name that you all are probably familiar with. Um, um, Henry Allen Boyd is a name that has been familiar in the news. Um, but then when I ask, do you know, what do y'all know about their wives? And usually there's their silence in the room. And that's a shame because these women were remarkable women. And I humbly submit to you that the work that they did during these periods, these women's clubs were the precursors of the modern civil rights movement. If I thought a little while, I probably could make a really strong argument that they were the first civil rights organizations in this city, organizations that predate the NAACP. Now, when we think of women's clubs, um, I don't know, the, 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 the sort of chauvinist group, I mean, chauvinist view of history has us to believe, well, these are clubs where Ladies get together maybe and sew a little bit. They might play bridge, um, cut a few flowers, share recipes, and things of that nature. But no, um, that's far from the truth when we talk about these, these, these women's clubs. Um, women's clubs were organizations that form to meet the economic, social, and political needs of, um, of, of Black people, but in the context of this le lecture, Black Nashvillians during the era of Jim Crow. This particular photograph is one that I love. It's a photo of um, the Federation of Women's Club that met at First Baptist Church and I wrote Capitol Hill just so you guys would know what church I was referencing. But First Baptist Church, when it was located on the corner of 8th and, and Charlotte. When we look at these women, um, we see that they, most of them are really nicely dressed. And, and, and when we consider the makeup of these clubs, they, um, these women are mostly middle-class women who are very much concerned about the plight of African-Americans, in this case, in the state of, of Tennessee. Um, although you have to really probe deeply in the history of this city, but a little bit further up the street from where, where they are at, about four blocks from where they are at, um, you had a situation where there was every vice that you can think of imaginable happening in Nashville. So you had the gambling, your heavy drinking, your prostitution, 
And then that coupled with the effects of Jim Crow, with the effects of white supremacy on this community, right? Um, so you had poverty was a common feature of life for many African Americans in the city. Um, the relationship with the police left a lot to be desired at this time. So these women get together and they're trying to figure out what can we do to help the poorest people amongst us. And their target was primarily poor African-American women because they believed that if they could elevate them, then the, the race would better itself or the race could make progress. So hence, one of the organizations that becomes known as the National Association of Colored Women, they form and their motto is lifting as we climb. So what I'm saying to you in regards to the role of women in Nashville and the struggle for equality, um, they play prominent roles but they're oftentimes overshadowed by their husbands. And this is a slide that, that, that shows my point. I'm not sure how well y'all can see this, but um, when we look at the, particularly the, the married women, we see, like for example, Mrs. G.L. Jackson, GL is not her initial, it's her husband's initial. Her husband's initial was Green L. Jackson, who was one of the most prominent um, ministers in the, in the city. Green was, Reverend Jackson was uh, affiliated with the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Mrs. J.H. Hale, some of you might recognize her husband's name is John Henry Hale, the, um, the, the fabulous physician in the city. And then there are others. Mrs. J.C. Napier, whom we will talk about in a moment. Um, let me find one more. Okay. It, um, Mrs. W.J. Hale which a name which be near and dear to um, my TSU family out there. William Jasper Hale was the first president of, of TSU. But what I'm saying, I'm saying all that and saying this when it comes to public memory. You know, in the past, um, they rendered these women who did a great work invisible, so much so that even when we go to the newspapers, we can't even identify them. Um, I wrote a paper a couple of years ago that dealt with um, Black women in Nashville, and it was maddening for me because I'm like, eh, what were these women, what were their names? They, they had names, but I couldn't identify them. And then after a lot of research, I was able to to mine their names from the historical records and, and, and shed some light on the things they accomplished. I want to highlight a, a few right now. Um, Hattie Jackson and her husband was Green L. Jackson. Hattie Jackson became the president of the Nashville chapter of the Phyllis Wheatley Club. And this club was one of the most active and visible um, clubs in the city. There was a big fire at Walden University, um, great loss of life of, of young people at the time. I mean, it was bad, a dormitory caught on fire and they had taken, they had taken the fire escape out. So the girls, who were in there ended up having to jump from a third floor window. Many, many died. Well, under Miss Jackson, the Phyllis Wheatley Club took the lead at, at offering, um, offering aid to these girls. 
And moreover, they went on to help establish the Phyllis Wheatley Room at what was then Mercy Hospital here in Nashville. So um, she, um, this was a woman who was a prominent leader of an organization. Um, she was very active and, 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 and um, she really left her mark on the city's his, history, but she's largely been erased from the public record. So when I ask, for example, in class, I'll ask my students to name a person, a, a woman who was a prominent leader in Nashville, and inevitably they'll name somebody from the 60s or maybe the 70s. I'm like, go back further than that. Can you talk about somebody around the turn of the century? And, and um, the answer is usually no, but we have them in abundance. And be mindful of this when we're talking about all of these things that they're doing. They are still, their story is still a part of that narrative of the struggle for equality. And then um, this particular couple has made the news of late. Um, it, um, this is um, Henry Allen and his wife, Georgia Boyd. Um, for those of y'all that have been following, following the the um, the news, this this we've raised um, a lot of attention to the plight of the Boyd House, and um, I um, I, I want to to say that maybe, and, and, and I'm sorry because I'm thinking out loud here, but. Um, this, this, for me, this is one of the most important um, houses in this city, just for because of the the um, impact that these folks had not only on Nashville but on the country and arguably the world. Um, Henry Allen Boyd was one of the people that led to the founding of TSU um, at the end of Jefferson Street in 1912. But he also became the editor of the Boyd Publishing Company. Now this company printed religious material. So you start thinking about the hymnals, the Bibles, the Sunday school books. This was important for Baptists all over the globe, even within my own story. Um, my, my father was superintendent of our Sunday school for a long, long time. And it was a rite of passage and something that we looked forward to every month was that box of Sunday school books that would arrive. And with my father being the, the, the superintendent, he quickly opened it up and passed, passed the books out to my brothers and I. It's like, okay, y'all need to study your Sunday school lesson. And um, I talked about it being a rite of passage, right? Because when I really started paying attention, I was in the primary class. And I get in, it's like, okay, I got a year left and then I'll be in the junior class, okay? Then a few years go by, I'm an intermediate. Then a few years go by, then I'm a young adult. Then I'm like, okay, wow, I'm gonna be in the adult men's class in a couple of years. How cool is that? Then I get, I get to the point where I'm in the adult men's class and surprise, now I gotta teach the adult men's class. I'm like, I didn't wanna do all that. I just wanted to sit back there with the adults saying that kind of tongue in cheek, but I'm not because this, this thing was something that became a very personal, a very intimate part of our lives. So when I moved here to Nashville and um, I finally get a chance to see this home, a home that he constructed, a home that I know that 
a lot of Baptist churches from around the country um, provide money to raise. And I, I can imagine him hiring laborers from around Nashville to around North Nashville, right, to to lay the bricks, to do the carpentry. And then I can imagine Georgia Boyd, who was very much involved in the women's club movement herself, saying that I'm going to fix this place up nice so that when we meet here, this will be a place where we can come and discuss the business we need to discuss and everybody can be at ease. In, in my mind, this, this, this structure that we're looking at um, is almost a, a monument to the lives and the doings and the struggle for Black equality. So it's far, far more than just a house that sits on a corner um, adjacent to this university. Thank you. And this is, without doubt, my famous couple here in Nashville, Nettie Napier and her husband, J.C. Napier. Napier was um, one of the most powerful Black men in the city. He was a banker, he was a businessman. Um, he worked in the federal government for the um, Treasury Office, for the Department of Treasury, excuse me. Um, to this date, his name is the only name of a Black man that actually is featured on U.S. currency. So he's a, a um, important man. But his wife, Nettie Napier, was the um, daughter of John Mercer Langston, um, one of the most important Black politicians, I argue, from um, the 19th century. They meet each other at, um, when J.C. Napier was at, the, at Howard University pursuing his law degree. They meet and they fall in love and they get married. And this marriage, this wedding for African Americans was like the wedding of the century. Uh, that is, you have two people that are from really, really powerful circles. They connect and two families um, unite and, and you would expect great things from them. And, 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 um, just looking at it from from a distance, you, you say, okay, she, she's married to a well-to-do, very important man, so perhaps we'll just become, you know, his his wife and 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 um and um just fulfill those duties, you know, being the person that's on point when it comes to hosting. So a glorified hostess, I guess is the term I'm looking for. But that was not the case. Um, Nettie Napier was responsible for saving Frederick Douglass's home from being destroyed. So she becomes involved in, in, in public memory right from the start. And I guess that's why I have a history crush on her. But when she gets to Nashville, she creates something that's called the Day Home Club. And this club, what this club did was it, it, um, it sought to address the needs of poor working black women. And, and, and she specifically focused on black women who were mothers. So when you start thinking about it, you are a working mother, some of the things that you need, there's childcare, there's meals, um, if your child is in school, they would arrange to take them and to pick them up and to bring them back to this, 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 this building. Um, she provided for women who worked all three shifts. And she even had a doctor on retainer. 
that would um, come and, and provide the health care to the children. Now, when we hear this, and I'm just talking about all of the things that it did, you know, like jobs and education, child care, health care, all of these things still resonate with us today. So when we start thinking about the struggle for equality in the city as it exists today, be mindful that Black Nashvillians try to address this um, more than 100 years ago. And if we are honest with ourselves, women led the charge for this. And one of the most notable is um, our dear Nettie Nathan. And as we move further, um, I want to draw your attention to um, arguably my favorite Nashville. And, out of, and, and there are a lot that are worthy of note, but this is the one um, I really like. Um, this is Josie Wells. Josie Wells was actually from Mississippi, but she comes to Nashville where she um, she goes to Meharry and she earns a medical degree. And um, very quickly, people, the, the, the folks at Meharry recognize her talent. So by the 1920s, she was arguably the second most important person at Meharry. But here's the thing, she, um, she worked at the Nashville Sanitarium that would have been, um, been located in, not quite in North Nashville, but a little bit beyond, um, near where American Baptist is. But I think one of the most stark things or most um, interesting thing about her is her office. Her office was located near 4th Avenue North in Beater. And I don't know if I said that right, but I'm not a mate, so y'all forgive me. Um, when she opened up her office, and her office um, dealt primarily with diseases that felt that, that, that afflicted uh, women and children, when she opened up that office, she was the only woman in this entire city to have an office that was downtown. So she's an amazing woman who has carved out a career in a place that's dominated by men, right? But by that same token, um, with everything she's doing at Meharry and she's um, looking at the students at Walden, um, she has her own private practice. She still, she is still offering free health care for the young children and at times their mothers that are at the day home. Now this, I, I want to use a, a brief study, a brief glimpse of the, the African-American church as a, a segue into the modern civil rights movement. Um, the church on the left is um, is the church um, Andrew Andrew Jackson built for his enslaved community. Uh, we are mindful that the church could be used, and it was used as a, an instrument of enslaving African-Americans, right? Enslaved African-Americans, to enslave their mind, to get them to think that being a slave was their natural state. This is how it's supposed to be. But by that same token, um, African-Americans took this and, 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 and and, and used it for their own purposes in that they transformed that space, which was not designed to liberate them, but they took the space and turned it into a space of hope, a space of inspiration and a space that, that um, freed them from the, the, the um, troubles that they faced 
here and it gave them hope for the year after. So it um, within that church, you would have heard a lot of sermons that emphasize that slaves should be obedient to their masters in all things. Okay, and that's from some of the letters that Paul wrote. But by that same token, when they are out of the the earshot of their masters, they're talking about that interview that God had with Moses in Exodus. They hear him when he says, I've heard the cry of my people that are in Egypt. They hear that. And they get an understanding that, hey, maybe if God cares for these people, then they care, then he has those sort of emotions for me, those feelings for me. These two churches that I feature, um, the one on the left is the church that Jackson built and the one on the right is Capers Memorial, um, whose congregation um, goes back to an African mission that was created in 1832, right? Same sort of, of, of premise lays at the foundation of the, the creation of these churches. But as Capers emerges into the period of the Civil War, they're starting to talk about freedom in Capers. And as time progresses, as you get into the 20th century, they're starting to talk about equality. The churches become, in many ways, crucibles for Black leadership, if that makes any sense. Whereas during the slave, during the period of slavery, the most powerful man typically on, on the slave, on a plantation was um, the minister. And it kind of makes sense because the minister gets his, his um, message from God. So when you make that transition from slavery to freedom and you're starting to look for black leaders, those ministers make up a natural leadership class. So y'all think about this for a second. Um, when you start thinking about the, the prominent people in the civil rights movement here in Nashville, particularly when you start thinking about the men, most of those fellows were men of the cloth. Okay, because you can think about um, C.T. Vivian, he was a minister. Bernard Lafayette, um, was that American Baptist? John Lewis came to Nashville to be a preacher. Um, Kelly Miller Smith, a first Baptist who is featured prominently in the Nashville movement. He was a preacher as well. So these churches create a natural leadership class that we have to think about when we start thinking about the struggle for equality. But it goes a little bit further than that. Um, I want y'all to consider this. Um, Spruce, Spruce Street Baptist Church was um, one of the churches that was um, that grew up out of the Colored Baptist Church that was created during slavery in the city. Um, this church, I think of, uh, and I have to be careful here because I visit these churches and I know and love a lot of people that go there, so I don't want to make anybody angry. Um, but Bruce Street is something where the record is, is a church where the record is clear, where they um, they they become an, an institutional church, a church that is very much worried about not only their congregation's well-being in the hereafter, that is whether they go to hell or heaven, but they they want to make sure that they're doing okay in the here and now. All of these churches do that. Let me be clear on that. But um, 
but with this, the, the connection that I'm trying to make here is that um, Spruce Street engages the other powerful institution that comes up out of Reconstruction, and that being education. One of the most important schools in the history of the city is Pearl High School. If y'all ever meet any Pearl High grads and you ask them what high school they went to, you can almost tell immediately before they tell you that they went to Pearl because typically they stand up a little straighter, their chest puff out and they're like, I went to Pearl High School. And it's um, that, that, that pride is, is um, well deserved. I pulled this particular ad from um, um, this is 1907 Nashville Globe. And I was, I was initially looking at Pearl High School, but then I saw Spruce Street and I was like, okay, what are they doing here? And I saw this and I'll read the ad to you. It says Pearl High School debate. Spruce Street Baptist Church, Friday night, April 27th at eight o'clock. Resolved that the formation of a separate political party would be for the best interests of the Negro. Don't miss this debate, the most interesting debate ever given in Nashville, regardless of time, place, subject, or contestants. It's like, okay. Um, but let me go to the next slide because the, the print is kind of small. Okay. okay, so this is who's participating in this debate. Miss Tiny, um, I can't read her last name, Clinton. Um, the matchless, incomparable debater, Miss Mary Jackson, the eloquent platform speaker, those that will be, be debating the negative, was Miss Ruth Upshaw, the silver tongue orator, and Miss Mabel McGavick, the superb logician. Okay, it costs 15 cents to get in this, 25 cents for reserve seats. But what the thing that struck me with that these are high school girls who are having the same debates that me and the people that I ran with at Florida State, these, they're, they're having the same debates in high school that we had in graduate school. So they are thinking about equality at a very, very young age. So what am I, I saying? When we see young people out in the streets protesting um, and, and in whatever form they are protesting, understand that this is nothing new to Nashville. At least during the early 20th century, we got high school students that are doing it. And now this brings us to our, our, our modern era. Um, the man that you see on the screen now, this is a young version of Avon Williams. Um, Avon Williams, when he arrived in Nashville, he was heralded as the apostle of the apostle of civil rights. I just thought that was a brutal, a beautiful term, the apostle of civil rights. So he comes here. And there is an expectation that this man is going to do some heavy lifting when he comes to Nashville. And he did not disappoint. He was involved in the sit-in movement, um, various other civil rights cases. He was featured prominently when the decision was made to run I-40 through North Nashville. So the expectations for him were great. But then when he gets set in, settled in here in Nashville, he hooks up with arguably the greatest lawyer this 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 um, this state has produced, and and that being um, uh, Attorney Z. Alexander Luby. Luby and Williams figure prominently in how we understand the 
civil rights movement during the 1960s. But even in our exploration of the movement, it um, we 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 look at the struggle, but we oftentimes miss the struggle within the struggle, if that makes sense. Um, by the time um, Z. Alexander Luby's home is bombed, um, he's gotten up in age, right? And he's, he and Avon Williams oftentimes don't see eye to eye with what the students are doing. They don't see eye to eye with their methods. Nevertheless, they represent them right on and I present that for your consideration in, in that um, their reservations may be some of the same reservations we hold. Okay, we understand and sympathize with what they're trying to do, but we might not see eye to eye in how they are accomplishing it. Um, honestly, I, 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 as I look back, the only person that I can really think understood intuitively what the students were trying to accomplish, what they wanted to do, or at least the person that saw the need for them to create their own organizations was Ella Baker. Um, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was actually her brainchild. So as we get to the civil rights movement that um, that many of you may have witnessed or um, or know a lot about, um, we give um, James Lawson a lot of credit for the the, the vision, and in many instances, being the spiritual leader behind nonviolent protests. And oftentimes, when I think of just what he tried to accomplish from his arrival here um, during the late 1950s. Um, you know, he's asking people to do something that was really against human nature. That is to, although the scripture in turn, it, it instructs us to turn the other cheek, um, many of us, if not most of us are able to do that again and again and again. But what this does is it, it, it presents them with a moral high ground. It presents them with the discipline to um, fight this battle in a new way, in an exciting way, in, in a relentless way. And um, this, 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 this movement or this struggle um, is one of the, the most important moments, I think, in the history of the city, if, if not the country. Now, I'm saying all this to kind of set you up to think about what we witnessed in the 60s and what we see today. Um, Z. Alexander Luby's home was bombed by a group of terrorists on April 19th, 1960. Um, early that morning, um, they put anywhere from 19 to 21 sticks of dynamite at the corner of this house on Harry Boulevard. The bombing was, the bomb was detonated and it was so powerful that it shattered um, some windows that were across the street at Meharry Medical College. This, this assassination attempt galvanized our, our, our young people. And it gets to a point to where they, they say, hey, we need to talk to the... When I look at this, 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 this photograph that's superimposed over it is a um, photograph of Z. Alexander Luby's wife, Grafter. And I did not know how active she was 
in Nashville. Um, I know people that served with her on various committees around around um, around the city. And and um, I remember speaking um, with someone who spoke fondly of graphics. She said, yeah, "Well, Miss Luby was involved in a lot of things. We talked about her husband, and and rightfully so." But um, she was constantly involved in making this city a better place. So she was involved in the struggle for equality as well. I, I want y'all to consider this picture, though, as you look at it. Um, this is right in the aftermath of the bombing. And she looks shaken. She looks like she's been through something. And there's another photograph. I don't have it on this side of. Um, Avon Williams and Z. Alexander Luby in the hospital. And Luby is sitting up slouched in his chair and, and he looks whipped. And I can't um, tell you how many times that I've, I've studied them in the past, but I never really looked at them as being human beings, if that makes sense. I never really looked at them that, that um, as people that might have suffered moments of doubt and been worried about whether all of their labors had been in vain. So this 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 bombing and this this photograph of Luby in in my mind um, connects them to us in a really powerful way. And even as we get to the march, on the left, we have the silent march of April 19, 1960. Um, this is a march that is um, organized the same day as the bombing. They meet at TSU and began to walk toward City Hall and, and these folks want to talk to the mayor. And it is there where Diane Nash and C.T. Vivian and, and, and others confront the mayor um, to make a statement in terms of equality. She asked him if he, believe, if he believes that it's okay to discriminate against somebody because of their race. And he, she, and he replies, no. The photo on the right is from the walk in love. And this is a commemorative march that we take. Um, this, this is a commemorative march that we take around April 19th every year. We didn't do it last year because of COVID, but typically we march from TSU to Luby's house and then to the public square and we um, have a brief service where people want to talk and talk and so forth. Um, but we're, in doing this, as far as public memory goes, the, the, the walk from TSU to, to um, the public square, it's a very powerful physical reminder of, um, of what transpired on the day. And we're fortunate that many of the people are still around so you can ask them questions about how they felt in the aftermath of the bomb. And that brings us to today. Um, the inter interstate came through um, North Nashville in two places. And I understand, I understood the story about how it displaced people because it happened in other places. Um, you could tell the story in Alabama, you could tell the story in Georgia, you could tell it in Florida, South Carolina, and so forth. And in many instances, these displaced um, disrupted the Black community. When I first arrived in North Nashville, I, I was able to. Um, was able to hook up with some elders who grew up in this area prior to um, to the, the interstate coming through. And I can remember um, 
talking to this one gentleman. He was getting up in age, and I didn't realize he was sick at the time, but he would pick me up in his pickup truck at, um, at Harper's. And we'd ride around um, North Nashville. And the street that you're on right now is 12th Avenue North, 12th Avenue North. And right about here is where his house was. And it's completely gone now, right? The only thing that's there now is a chain link fence. And I thought about how the city, the state, and this country essentially colluded to erase the, the built environment. As a matter of fact, the memory of these people from our collective memories. And this quote I had on, 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 the, on the screen um, is directly, this is something he told me while we was in the, um, in the truck that I presented at a, a conference. And I, and I wrote, in the house on 12th Avenue North, once occupied by the coal and ice man, the bungalow owned by the Meharry trained dentist who lived next door as well as the neighboring homes of the physician and university professor no longer exist. And I remember asking him, asking him, he's like, well, where, where are they now? And he's like, nobody knows, they're just gone. And the thing that's really frustrating about this is that um, we knew what was going to happen before they pulled up with the first bulldozer. We understood what was going to happen, but it proceeded anyway. And we're mindful that this wasn't the first route, right? They, um, there was a route that um, said it should go through Bell Mead. There was another one that said it ought to go um, during the, right where the, uh, where Briley Parkway is currently located. But this is the space that was selected and it decimated the African-American community. Now I'm saying all that to say this. Um, there's a direct line between what you see here and the gentrification that we are witnessing today. This is the last slide we need time for my favorite part of the lecture. Um, this is a protest from the 1960s in front of Morrison's. You see many, many young people there. The police are observing and they have their fists raised as in a form of, um, of power. Um, we look at them and they are um, very emotional. You see some that are screaming. And in my mind, they are saying that they matter. They are important. They need to be treated as equals in this country. And then this is a photograph I took. The one on the bottom right is a photograph I took in the aftermath of um, of uh, Mike Brown, Michael Brown being being killed uh, in St. Louis. I, um, I I took the photograph of this, or actually, I was I was aiming for the young woman um, that was that's on the left who is holding up the placard because her face express the, the, the pain that all of us felt, that deep hurt that all of us felt at the sight of this boy being gunned down by the police and more or less being left on display for five hours in, in the street. And how we saw that image over and over and over again. And then, um, and then the young girl who was holding up the card. So for me, this, this photograph represents the fact that the struggle for equality is transgenerational. It has been ongoing. And uh, um, we submit to you, and I'll close with this, that it has been 
something that has been occurring, a struggle for equality, has been something that has been going on since Jack Civil listened and didn't hear that he was receiving land from, from James Robertson. Okay. With that, our, our close. That was kind of a long lecture. So um, if you need to take a breath, um, a break, or take a deep breath before a Q and A, I can I can do that, or we can just launch right into it. But thank you so much for listening this evening. Thanks, Dr. Williams. Um, questions? Feel free to put them up in the chat if you want us to moderate, or. Uh, Oh, I don't want to put your head. Yeah, you were talking. I didn't you, put you, you sleep. I hope. No, no. You, when you were talking about W. E. B. Du Bois, and I happen to have been reading a lot of him mm -hmm. over the past several weeks, um, and I guess one of the things that has struck me as I've been reading was why wasn't anyone listening or who was listening to Du Bois that might have changed? Wow, that's, um, that's a really good question. Um, I guess on, on one hand, he was speaking to America, right? But those in power were not trying to hear it. When Du Bois really begins to come into his own, um, Woodrow Wilson was president, and and um, for a long, long time, I used to think that Woodrow Wilson was probably the most racist president we ever had. Um, and he was raising his voice at least early during his career during a time when they were lynching African Americans. So um, much of his criticism, much of his work was written to America. He was holding up a mirror to America. Um, but not a lot of folks are listening. And as I, I think about it, it um, his was not the only voice. So there are other people. I mean, his is probably the most eloquent and the most articulate. But you have Marcus Garvey, who is in America, and he has the UNIA up, and they are enjoying some support, at least in the northern cities. But I've recently um, found a, a, an excerpt that said Marcus Garvey paid a, a, a trip to Nashville. I did not know that. Um, du Bois is working in the area of civil rights. If you have others who, who very much still hew to Washington's idea. And, and be mindful of this too. Um, Washington had some very wealthy benefactors, which enable him to develop something that's really interesting in Tuskegee. And I, when I talk about Washington in class, I, I introduce him as being the most powerful black man that ever lived in America until President Obama is elected. But now I might even have to think about that and just say black person, because now we have Kamala Harris as the vice president. So, we, but we're still, still um, writing the book on her. We maybe be on chapter two of her. I'm not, Sure, but there's more to be said about it. Um, and, and lastly, Du Bois was into a lot of things. One of the things was Pan-Africanism. And in my mind, that was one of, the, one of his best efforts, the idea to get us to a point to where we identified with the African struggle for equality and recognized that their struggle was African. Thank you for the question. Uh, following up on that, in your opinion, um, who are the living Black intellectuals that we should be reading today? Uh, 
maybe not to compare anyone to Du Bois, but um, are there voices that are as prophetic as his were or his was? I, um, I, I, um, I don't know if there's anybody out there maybe that I would put on, on his level and, 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 um, Hmm, that's a really interesting question. I, I'll put a name out there uh, of a guy who has impacted me, um, but he's got kind of quiet now. But I, I, I listen, or I, I, I can remember reading um, Cornell West's um, Prophecy Delivered as a grad student, and that. That really, um, that really impacted me in terms of um, just how I, I view, view the world. But um, I've been engaging a lot of writers now, I and mean, some of them are, are, are poets. I really, I'm really a fan of. Um, Jasmine Ward right now. Um, and of Natasha um, Trefway. And, and and they are they are writers, but they are intellectuals um, that that um, you know the ideas that resonate in their works. These these are the folks that I've I've been focusing on. But with, with my journey, I um, I, I read so much history until um, I'm missing out on a lot of ideas by reading other stuff. So like this, this um, maybe poetry that can inform our understanding of the world, or just a, 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 a an autobiography or a biography of some written work. Um, but I will too say this look beyond the written word, check out some of the stuff that your artists are putting out there to inform um, what, what you, what you, I mean, your, your understanding of your world, your, your, your ideas that you are grappling with. So I kind of answered that, but I def, didn't, but if you want, I would, um, you might can see some of her books on my shelf, right? Um, if you want to gain some insight into what's going on now or the way the world is moving now and, and maybe how black people are thinking or the new ways they're thinking, um, those those two ladies, um, Desmond Ward and Natasha Trefway would be the ones that, um, that I would first say. Um, not so much the folks on TV right now. Um, just the, the people in print. And, and now I think about both of them are from Mississippi. So the good answer is whatever's coming out of Mississippi right now is probably pretty good as far as intellectual development. Okay. Thank you for your question. Yeah, I appreciate the answer. Uh, I know that Cornell West is famous for um, race matters, but mm -hmm. I, I've actually found, and I agree, prophesied deliverance is a more robust treatment of, of these things. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Um, someone's curious about the movement to preserve the Boyd House that you mentioned in your lecture. Uh, is there um, something that, that we might participate in or, or how, how would one go about getting involved in that? I really think it's out of our hands right now. I, um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you all a quick story, and this will be quick for the time. I, um, I, I serve on a lot of committees, and I caught wind that um, the Boyd House was in danger of being demolished. Then someone called me 
Saturday night and you were like, Lee, the um the the bulldozer is gonna be there Monday morning. So I, I created a moveon.org petition. And I didn't know what because who can you call on a Saturday night going in the summer bulldozer? So I put that out there and it generated enough signatures, enough support that I, I, I sent the petition to um, to some folks at Fisk University who owns the property. And um, it was enough to arrest the destruction of it. And after that, it was more or less out of our hands. I mean, we listed it on um, Historic Nashville as one of the, um, the nine properties that we need to focus on in the city as far as demolition. Um, but I'm happy to report that it's still here and they are working. Several people are hard at work at, at determining what it will become. But um, I, I, as I sit here tonight, I, I don't think it'll be full though. Can I can I make an observation? Yes. Okay. Um, a few years ago, when I was working with Ty and Nashville together, I got to know some of the ministers and Ed Kendall and some of the others in North Nashville, and I remember they telling me the impact that uh, that 440 had on neighborhoods, mm -hmm. and also the difference between. And then, you know, people moving out and the gentrification that was taking place. But the thing that struck me so much was they're telling me that they grew up in these well, mixed neighborhoods socioeconomically. And so, as you described, one where there was a physician, a professor, coal man, ice man, that type of thing. And that those children growing up in those neighborhoods, uh, it did not enter their mind that they wouldn't go on to Meharry, to TSU, to college. And what a difference has taken place in terms of um, children oftentimes, particularly in the um, more poor neighborhoods and their vision of a future. I was really, I just was really struck by that. And I guess I was struck by it too because of what's happened in our whole society in terms of just kind of homogenous neighborhoods. And, um, and people's fear of having, quote, quote, lower income people moving into their neighborhood is that that's gonna take the neighborhood down as opposed to maybe this gives them some idea of where they can go, what they can become. Mm. I just was really, it just really struck me as kind of what's happened. I, I, um, Marianne, I, I I love talking to Ed and those the, the other folks down there because it seems like they get a little bit wiser about the world from every conversation I have with them. Um, but the, the relationship of that community with Meharry, TSU, and Fisk with right. Pearl was intimate. Um, and you can still see whispers of it today, right? Because I, um, I'll, I'll go to a TSU football game when we play in the hole, in the holes actually, although McKissick had the contract for it, they use TSU student labor. Um, I'll go there and I'll, I'll, I'll um, just hang out and wait for the game to start and, um, the band will come walking, marching down the street and they're playing their music. And then all of a sudden you see the doors open up and um, people come on the porches. And um, it, it, it's as though they realize that something is about to happen and they should check it out, right? And then there'll always be a group down at the corner, um, right by the stadium, and they'll be dancing and all of that. So it, it was a sort of family type atmosphere. And then also people in the community used to take care of the overflow at those universities, right? So if they didn't have 
housing that could accommodate them. They could stay with members of the community. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of that left with the interstate. And then time progresses too. When you start thinking about it, I, um, some of that could be expected because as, as, as children, and don't take this the wrong way, but as, as children, we, we tend to want to murder our parents. That is, we tend to want to break away, to go off into the world to do our own things. And oftentimes that means that we leave. And um, the, the attachment to these spaces are not as strong, not until the, the things get in trouble and we try to rush and play with it, but then by then it might be too late. Um, but it, when, when I look at North Nashville, I look at it as a place that, that suffered um, a trauma during the 1960s with the interstate, but also from a place that's overgoing a slow poison, that is a poison that kills you over time, slowly but surely, next thing you know, it's gone. Because we're mindful, I'll say this, and I know I'm beating the question to death. Um, neighborhoods evolve the same way human beings do. Right? They are born, then they reach adolescence, then neighborhoods get advanced in age. Then the next step is either they die or they become something else. Now, who determines that something else? Your memory plays an important role in how what that something else is. Thank you for your question. Thank you. May I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Williams, thank you so much for your insights. I've learned a lot tonight and I have a plethora of things to research on the internet. <laughs> uh, I especially appreciate your acknowledgement of women in the fight. Uh, but one thing, one thing got brought to mind, I'm just very curious about this church that Andrew Jackson built for his slaves. Who were these ministers that preached to the slaves that they were so well off, and this is the way that they're supposed to be. Who, who, where did he get find these ministers? They must have been white ministers. I'm, I'm assuming they were, but I'll, I'll be honest. I don't know the. That's probably you'll have to probably call out to the. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate everything you told us tonight. Thank you. No, thank you. I'm sorry I couldn't do better with the question. Maybe one more question before we close for the night. Sorry. I'm just curious about uh, whether you have had any stories about the role that St. Vincent's and particularly uh, the grade school had in some of the education of, um, of black people who later, you know, went to college and all, but also became figures in town, that prominent figures in town. Unfortunately, I'm not um, an expert on on St. Vincent, and I don't. I um, be honest, I'm not qualified to even address. Okay, there's some stories, and you know, Francis Guess and and uh, just some others that I met along the way who said that they had their grade school in you know going to St. Vincent's. I, I do know some proud graduates of, mm -hmm. of St. Vincent. Matter of fact, day before yesterday. Um, one told me very clearly that not all of us went to Earl. And, uh, but I, I'm, I'm, that's an area that I'll, I'll need to give um, a bit more attention because it, it's right there in North Nashville. Right, right. A, a dear friend of mine, um, um, Dr. Revis Mitchell, um, yeah, mm -hmm. he, he was a proud St. Vincent. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and, 
And the school was founded by somebody who was recently, fairly recently became canonized, the Saint, Saint Cat, uh, Catherine Drexel. Yes. Yeah. Uh, now's a good time for me to remind everyone that this Sunday, uh, Deacon Bill Hill from Holy Family will be speaking on this very topic. Uh, so he may be able to add a little bit of this um, more specifically Catholic uh, history of uh, the Black Church. Uh, hopefully, anyway, we'll find out. I would think so. He was speaking at St. Vincent's before going over to Holy Family. So. Right. What a shift. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> All right. Well, Dr. Williams, uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing your hard-won knowledge and expertise uh, and your heart with us. Um, we'd love to have you back again. Hopefully, we won't have to wait a year uh, to do it, but um, we, we'd love to uh, continue learning from you. Thank you for inviting me to share my thoughts with you. I appreciate it. Thank you. I have one last question. Are yeah. you offering lessons in how to make good grits? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll put this out here. Um, go with the chicken broth instead <laughs> of water. That makes sense. <laughs> Thank you. We've got it on camera. Uh, <laughs> there. Yeah, I'm going to be exercise from a family. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks very much. And Thank you. Christ the King Parish. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. Hey, thank you, thank you very much. Take care. Okay, I'll see you later. Bye.